About one year ago, I had the opportunity to go on a once in a lifetime trip to the Italian Dolomites with my good friends Basti and Yudis. This was an amazing trip. I got to take an absolute boatload of photos with my Pentax 67 with my Olympus Ohm 4 Ti, and then with this little 1950s folder camera that you might not recognize. So you might be wondering, why would I bring this old folder camera along for a once in a lifetime trip? Well, first, this folder camera happens to be the Falklander Perkyo 2, which is one of the smallest medium format cameras ever produced. Not only that, but actually produces really fantastic images. And if you can see, I mainly shot black and white with this camera and the photos truly speak for themselves. I really love this camera. It happens to be one of my favorite folders in spite of its relatively straightforward, not so many features um, build. Nonetheless, it is a camera worth trying if you are looking to get into the world of small folders. And I really mean it when I say that this camera is damn small. It's a six by six camera that can fit in your pocket, can fit in your little fanny pack, and you can carry it anywhere you wanna go pretty much every day. Just to have the ability to carry a medium format camera with you every day and still have an intact spinal column is actually pretty nice. So let's dive into the history of this camera. It actually stretches all the way back in the 1930s when Falklander produced the Bessa 6.6, which happens to be a six by six folder, pretty much of equal size. And the lenses varied from pretty high end to more consumer level. You could produce some fantastic images with this camera. And it only got better really getting into the 1950s when Falklander came out with first the Perkyo 1 and then the Perkyo 2. Perkyo 1 and Perkyo 2 really look like the same camera from the outside. And there are some minor differences between the two that are worth noting. The first difference between the two cameras is that the Perkyo 1 actually has a basic red window to advance your medium format film. This can be nice because you don't have to rely on any sort of mechanism failing on you. And then the Perkyo 2 also has the red window and that's more so for the sake of loading. And then you also have automatic film advance afterwards, which can be quite convenient, especially for a 1950s folder. That's not a very common feature. The second difference between the two cameras comes down to lenses. The Perkyo 1 came with multiple lenses. First, you had the more consumer level of Vascar lens. And then on the high end, you had the 75 millimeter F3.5 color scope bar. For the Perkyo 2 series, you only had the high end color scope bar lens because it was the higher end version of the camera. And this lens is truly fantastic. The color rendition, sharpness, and contrast makes it one of my favorite folder lenses of all time. Other than that, the Perkyo 1 and 2 are very similar cameras. They both rely on the simple viewfinder scale focusing system. And you can also just do a normal rangefinder attachment on top. I use the Falklander rangefinder attachment and it makes shooting pretty easily. And it all still fits even with the lens hood filter extra film into a little fanny pack, which is just awesome. Still a very compact system, even with this accessory rangefinder. And that reminds me, there's actually a third Perkyo, that's a Perkyo 3 or Perkyo E, and that one has a built-in uncoupled rangefinder. And I'd love to try that one these days because it would still be a small camera, absolutely full of features. Using the Falklander Perkyo 2 is pretty straightforward. It only takes one or two times to really get it down. It's like most folders, honestly. The only difference really comes with loading the camera. And to load the camera, there isn't much to it either. Really, you just have to flip this switch on the back to the right. Then you load the film like normal until it's spooled on at least. You close the back and open the red window, and then you wind on until you get to frame one, which you will see in the red window. From there, you flip the switch back once more, and you'll see that you're actually automatically setting the film counter to frame one. From there, you can just automatically advance, easy peasy. Now that I kind of told you the history and the function of this camera, let's take it out into the field once more. This was after my trip to the Dolomites. I had the opportunity to be in Germany and to photograph once again in the springtime. So as I said, it was a nice spring day in Germany. I was in the city of Hannover and I was out shooting with my friend Hendrik. If you don't know him, I'd definitely recommend checking out his work and his YouTube channel that he and Ferry share. The YouTube channel is called Shutter Speed and I will make a link in the description for you to check out. So anyways, I decided to bring along a roll of Portra 400 because this lens and this camera can do quite well with both color and black and white. This first photo did a pretty good job at rendering color and contrast, but as you can see, there is a very gentle camera shake there that kind of ruins the photo for me. And that's one thing about this camera is that if you hold it the wrong way, it is gonna shake on you when you press down the trigger, the shutter, and if it jolts a little bit, then you're gonna get that shake. 
I should mention that after this shot, I don't really have much from this roll portrait 400 because I messed it up in the dark room and destroyed half the roll because I'm an idiot. I really like how this portrait of Hendrik turned out. For one, I shot this all the way wide open at 3.5, yet I still managed to get him in focus. It is a narrow depth of field. And the other thing is that I was able to use a rangefinder accessory, which would be uncoupled technically from the lens and was able to nail the focus in that regard. One thing about these cameras, a lot of folders and this camera in particular, is that the lens uses front cell focusing, which means it's only the front portion of the lens that moves to bring an object into focus which is typically fine stop down or closer to infinity with a landscape. But if you're shooting up close, it can be a little tricky because the front cell focus style really doesn't render closer objects as sharp. I really like how this third photo turned out on the roll. Although I will say I did get some more camera shake once again, and I was shooting at one 25th of a second, so I wasn't shooting super slow. By this point, the sun had gone down mostly and there really wasn't enough light to shoot with, so I decided to go back to the apartment and call it a day. The next morning, I woke up to very thick, persistent fog that coated the whole city of Hanover. And I figured this would be a good opportunity to go into the Eidenrita, which is the city forest nearby the city park. Really beautiful area to photograph in the springtime. And then from there, I was just gonna shoot some foggy landscapes. After finishing my roll of Portrait 400, I decided to switch over to black and white film. The monochromatic foggy four scenes really scream black and white to me, and I was more than happy to oblige. First, I flipped the film advance switch over, and then I load up some good old Kodak Tri-X. I wound it to the first frame in the red window, and then re-engaged the film advance switch. I also elected to use a yellow filter to bring out a little more contrast in this roll. I'm a big fan of this first photo in particular. The way that the fog separates this tree trunk from the background is really just chef's kiss. It's really a simple composition that I enjoy to take, especially in foggy conditions. And the sharpness and contrast that this lens rendered really was spot on. This last photo might be one of my favorites from the whole outing that day and the day prior, just because of the composition. It's a straightforward, down the middle road composition. Well, there you have it. Two rolls of film with the Falklander Perkyo 2 in Hanover. Unfortunately, I did mess up that roll of Portrait 400 because I'm an idiot. I was trying to double load the Jobo rotary reel in the dark room and I actually had them overlap. So I had the two overlapping rolls, pretty much those halves that overlapped become completely ruined. Enough about my own stupidity, let's talk about this camera and some of the things I like and dislike about it. First, what I like is of course the lens, color rendition, sharpness that comes from the 75 millimeter f3.5 color scope bar. Of course, there's the size, I really love the size. When I was out shooting in the fog in the forest and with my friend Hendrik, it was a pretty light minimalistic kit that I had and that can be quite nice just on any given day. The last thing I really like about this camera is the Falklander build quality. If you've ever owned a Falklander camera from the 1950s, then you probably know just how well finished these cameras are, how well built, and on occasion, how well designed, because they do have some cameras in the period that are a little tricky. In any case, it's a camera that I really love to bring along, but it is also a camera without faults. One of the faults, of course, is this front self-focusing that I mentioned. It's not ideal for closer subjects, and overall, just, it's not gonna give you the photo quality at all times like you do from a whole unit focusing camera. Another thing that I'm not so crazy about is just how often I get camera shake out of this camera. That does come from me though mainly, just how I held it perhaps, but folders are known to be more prone to camera shake. So it is something you do have to look out for and just something you have to remember 
when you're trying out any sort of folder, not even just a Parrot Go 2. One more thing I'm not so crazy about is the scale focus, lack of range finder. Of course, if you do have an accessory range finder, it's not a biggie. But if you're trying to actually do scale focusing with anything but wide landscapes, then it's going to be a little tricky to nail the focus. And if you're stopped down, it's not an issue. But if you're just doing it handheld, you're not going to always have the opportunity to shoot stop down, in which case this can be a tricky camera. And this also has to do with the uh, viewfinder, which is fairly small and sometimes doesn't give you the accuracy you want because it's just a simple square viewfinder with no frame lines or anything of that sort. But that's also just standard of folders from this time period. Nonetheless, I really like this camera and perhaps some of you will be inspired to give it a try or the Parakeo one a try. They're both great cameras and for the size, it's hard to beat.